You're listening to Let's Get It On with Big John McCarthy and Sean Wheelock. Big John McCarthy has witnessed the best that the UFC had to offer. That is it! Game, set, and we have a new champion! Your backstage pass to the world of mixed martial arts and combat sports. Only on the Ignotainment Media Network. Let's get it on! Hey everyone, welcome to Let's Get It On with Big John McCarthy and me, Sean Wheelock. Every week on this podcast, John and I give you an inside look at MMA and combat sports, always separating fact from fiction. On this week's program, we'll discuss the suspension issued to Anderson Silva by the Nevada State Athletic Commission for performance-enhancing drugs and look at Silva's heavily derided defense. Plus, we'll be speaking with Casey Oxendine, CEO of Arena Combat, which features two-on-two fighting and is set to hold its first sanctioned professional event next month in South Carolina. And as we do on every episode of Let's Get It On, John will answer your questions. So ask away via email, info at letsgetitonpodcast.com. Again, that's info at letsgetitonpodcast.com. Remember that you can download and subscribe to our podcast on the iTunes Store. For Android, download the Stitcher app and subscribe. And you can go straight to our website, letsgetitonpodcast.com. Well, this past Thursday, of course, former UFC middleweight champion Anderson Silva was suspended for one year and fined $380,000 by the Nevada State Athletic Commission for testing positive for performance-enhancing drugs. Following his unanimous decision win over Nate Diaz on January 31st, the victory has now been changed to a no contest, and John Silva's defense was really laughable to the point of being kind of cringeworthy. Uh, it was not exactly what you'd want. Uh, you don't want that going down in history as uh, you know one of the things that you were a part of. It, it, just, it just sounded bad, I and mean, you know, you, you looked at the Nevada State Athletic Commission, the commissioners are sitting up there and they're actually just giving that look like you're trying to t- tell me that you're taking this blue liquid from Thailand and that's the reason that you, okay, I got it. Oh, you're taking it for sexual, you know, perform. okay. And they're just like, you're lying to me. And, you know, and it's, it's too bad. I, I, I really feel bad, you know, in a way for Anderson that, Someone talked him into that. You know, he had some advisor that talked him into this is what we're going to say. Instead of just saying, you know what? I made a mistake. I screwed up. I took something. This is the reason why I took it. And you, you, you absolutely caught me with it. I shouldn't have taken it. And whatever you guys decide is best. That would have made him stand out as, as the classy supreme athlete that we've always known. And he, in some way, this defense just makes him look, you know, sad. It makes him look weak. It makes him look, you know, uh, you know, like he's trying to get away with something. And that's not the way that people want to see you. Well, let's talk about this cringeworthy worthy defense. Essentially, and I guess it was his lawyer. I'm guessing it was his lawyer who put him up to it, saying that this blue liquid was for sexual performance. But... In the year 2015, if you're an athlete and you're being drug tested, you better know what you're putting in your body. It doesn't matter if it's a blue <laughs> well, liquid at least coming they, from Thailand or at GNC. Least they, at least they kept it to the blue color. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on. I mean, if he's paying a lawyer to come up with that, that lawyer should be beat down. All right? Because you don't deserve to get paid anything. You're a moron. You know, I just, I don't, you know, I, I look at that and Anderson is a good person. He's a good man. And, you know, good men can make mistakes and he made a mistake. All right. Just, you know what? Own up to your mistake and let's move on. But when you listen to some idiot say, we're going to say that we, are, we have a limp dick, you know, because that's really what you're saying. I got a limp dick and I can't get hard, so I need something to you know get me hard. And now I'm going to say that I don't go to the doctor down the street. I go through a friend who has this guy, this witch doctor in Thailand that comes up with this blue sauce. Jesus Christ. I mean, how much more far-fetched can you get? It really is to the point, as I said, of, of laughable, cringeworthy. But also, we talked on this program earlier about Propecia, which is for hair loss. And it's a banned substance by the IOC, or at least the active ingredient, and I don't know what that's called, but the active ingredient in Propecia is a banned substance by the IOC. 
and you had athletes testing positive because it's a masking agent saying, I had no idea. I'm just trying to keep a nice head of hair to which the IOC responded and WADA responded and USADA responded. That's fine, but you are 100% responsible for what goes into your body. It doesn't matter what the purposes are. If you're caught with an illegal substance, you're caught with an illegal substance. I don't think athletes are still getting that, though, John. <laughs> I don't think they are either. It's God, it's amazing how, you know, it's not only athletes, it's the fans, how they don't understand this stuff. And you look and you go, what is so hard to understand? And that you are responsible for what you put in your body. And if you have a friend that comes up to you and says, hey, I got this cream. It's awesome in taking care of aches. That's awesome. What's in it? I have to know because I am a professional athlete and I'm going to get tested. And if that cream has something in it that is on the banned substance list, that's going to screw me over. So I don't use your cream until I find out exactly what's in it. And I take it to a doctor and I say, I need you to tell me, can I take this? And he's going to look and say, no, you can't take that. And then you don't take it, you know, and it's the, the whole thing is everyone's saying, well, I'll, you know, he was just doing this. Look at Anderson knows what he did. Anderson is a grown man and we make choices in our lives. And when we make those choices, sometimes there's consequences that come with those choices and we get caught and we have those consequences. And when the consequence comes, don't cry. Don't sit there and whine. Don't complain. Don't make an excuse. Sit there and say, yep, I screwed up. Get slapped on the hand. Get slapped on the ass, whatever it is, and move on. That's what people can accept. People cannot accept you going out there and not admitting, you know what? I, I made a mistake. I did wrong. Anderson Silva is now 40 years old. Just a few years ago, people were talking about him, not just as the best pound-for-pound -pound fighter in the world, but maybe the greatest fighter in the brief history of MMA. All of that seems to now Absolutely. be kind of washed away. If you just look at the year of, of Anderson Silva, the last two years, you know, he loses his title because he's clowning. He then comes back, has a horrific leg break, no fault of his own. But then he uh, he's testing positive. He has this ridiculous defense. He's trying to represent Brazil in Taekwondo when the Brazilian Taekwondo Federation and athletes come out and say, what a sham, what a fraud. It just seems like this fall is more and more precipitous. Maybe this is the rock bottom for Anderson Silva. You know, clearly he can come back. He can fight. He can be relevant. He can win. I don't know if he has that desire. I don't know where he goes after this. It's a one-year suspension, but it's retroactive to the Diaz fight. So it's January 31st, 2016 is what the suspension yep. lasts to, not actually from the date handed down by the Nevada State Athletic Commission, August 13th. So that's in his favor. But what a weird reversal of fortune in the career of Anderson Silva. I mean, think about what we would have said about Anderson Silva had we been doing this program in 2011 to our comments now. Oh, you know, and that's, you have a legacy and you have this, you know, legacy that, you know, you're the one that's the artist of it. And he's been the artist of it. You know, when, when he started in the UFC with his run, I did his first fight against Chris Lieben and he walked through Chris Lieben so fast and easy and just destroyed him and then was given a title shot right away and just crushed Rich Franklin. And from that point, he held that title for God knows, you know, 2,000 in some days. You know, it was an amazing run because, you know, every time he's fighting, he's not at 100%. And he's not, you know, some days he's fighting, you know, it's a good day for him. He's feeling good. And some days he's fighting, it's a bad day for him. And he always came out on top. You look at the beating that he actually took against Chael Sonnen for, you know, four and a half rounds. He was getting his ass handed to him. A lot of those judges had turned in 10-8 rounds in some of those rounds. That's how bad he was getting beat by Chael, and he found a way to win. That made him amazing. And you know, you, you look at what's gone on in the last couple of years, and it's it's really too bad that it's getting to the point where he's almost becoming that you know fighter that people are going. Eh, he's I just don't like you know what he's doing. He's a good person. I, I like Anderson Silva. I've been around Anderson, you know, in fighting. I've been around, around him outside of fighting. He is a quality person. He obviously the weight of the title got to him after a while, and it is a weight. It's it's a it's a pressure that people that don't have it will never understand. But it's 
it's a matter of once he lost it, he realized what he lost. And now he's trying to get it back. And in getting it back, I think he made a bad decision. In trying to get it back, he made a bad decision. And that's okay. He's human. You make a bad decision. But don't sit there, make the bad decision, and then try to cover it. Don't try to make a story for it. Don't sit there and do something that's going to taint your legacy. Every week here on Let's Get It On, we bring you our poll question. You can, of course, cast your vote on our website, letsgetitonpodcast.com. This week's poll question, do you feel that Anderson Silva's one-year suspension issued by the Nevada State Athletic Commission was too lenient, correct, or too severe? Let us know what you think. Let your voice be heard. Let's get it on podcast.com. A lot of people, John, are saying it's pretty lenient one year, and there's almost a spin. It's not even a full year because it's not like Anderson Silva would have been back fighting in February or March. So it almost feels like a six or an eight month suspension. Well, you know, it, look at you know, it's a year suspension because it goes from the date of the fight. When was it that he got tested? He got tested on the date of the fight. He also got tested, you know, almost a month before it, and actually tested dirty then too. And so you look and you go, you know. You can go off of either of those dates. They're going off of the latest date, and that's the, the date of the fight. So, you know, it's a one-year suspension. It's a first time for him. It's not like it's a second time. So it's a hefty suspension. It's a hefty fine. Look at the fine that he paid, $380,000. Yeah. All right, well, you know what? I would be crying right now in my bed if someone tried to take three hundred sixty. Well, they couldn't take it. I don't have that kind of money, but <laughs> it's, a, you know. It's a matter of you know, someone you know find me that kind of money. Holy Christ, I'm going to jump off the bridge. Anderson Silva, you just have to wonder, John, where does he go here again? 40 years old. Does he come back? Does he try to dedicate everything he has to again be the champion, again be seen as one of the pound-for-pound pound greats in the sport, restore his legacy? Or is this it? Is this the moment where he just thinks that I'm done? Does he have that desire to get back? You know, sometimes good enough when you're a champion is no longer good enough. You just can't be a regular guy when you've been the guy. Well, you know, look at let's you know, let's be as honest as we can about this. He is forty years old. And you know, what made Anderson, you know, who he was was, you know, he had speed. He had the ability to see something coming and move his head that little bit so it slipped. Look at what he did with Forrest Griffin. Look at what he did with Rich Franklin. All those times he sat there and he would slip and have someone miss and then he would fire and hit him. That's what make, made Anderson successful. And at 40 years old, you know, father time, you know, we've talked about him before, man. He doesn't, he doesn't care about anybody and he will take that speed from you. And at this point, you know, just in my opinion, you know, can Anderson fight? Anderson can fight. He has the skill. He has, you know, the technical ability. He has the knowledge. You know, is he going to be that guy that's going to challenge for the title at 40? I don't think so. You know, he doesn't have the kind of game. Randy Couture was able to challenge and fight at an age that was, you know, surpassed 40 in the fact that he had a style that worked for, you know, the age factor and the speed factor. He, he slowed things down with his clinch game. He made people work, you know, in something that he was very good at, at in a way that made it very difficult for them to maintain a pace that he was able to actually control through his grappling and his Greco. That's not the way Anderson fights. Anderson fought off of speed. Anderson fought off of movement. Anderson did not want to be in contact with people. He wanted to strike with them. And when you get that kind of athlete, you know, look at Roy Jones Jr. Roy Jones Jr. still fights today, you know, and he still wins today. But can he beat, you know, the top guys? No, can't do it. He doesn't have the speed, doesn't have the reflexes, and they hit him and they hurt him too much. And I think that's what's going to happen with Anderson. I'm someone who's long admired Anderson Silva as a fighter, going back to when he was in Japan in Pride and what I don't like to see is him now being kind of a joke. And whether it's the Taekwondo Federation of Brazil or it's this blue liquid from Thailand, he's kind of being perceived as a joke. And if you're a 16 or a 17-year-old MMA fan, maybe you don't know how great Anderson Silva is. Maybe you're, it's like talking about Igor Volchanchin. It's just kind of a name <laughs> lost to history. Now he's this old guy talking about erectile dysfunction. Yeah, you know, I, first off, uh, as 
you know, the only way I can say Anderson is definitely not a joke. Anderson was, you know, one of the greatest fighters that has ever participated in the sport of MMA. Oh, f- fully what, agreed. No, what no matter what did, happens now. Fully agreed, John. What exactly what he did was incredible and you can't take it away from him. You know, Fedor is coming back. And you know, people are looking at that and there's a lot of people excited about it. I'm not that excited about it. Now, I there's reasons why I'm not. But Fedor at one time was unbelievable. To think that he's going to come back and be as successful as he was before is just not truthful. It's just not it's not clear thinking. And you know, all these guys, you know, there's going to be that point where they're no longer the king. They're no longer the guy. And Anderson may have reached that point now, and this all taints, you know, what he did in the end of his career a little bit, but it can't take away from what the basis of his career was. Yeah, and I think that in all sports, sometimes it's weird how you're remembered. I think Brett Favre, for a lot of people, is remembered as the guy who kind of kicked around and he was with the Jets and he was with the Vikings and he wouldn't retire, as opposed to being the greatest quarterback in the league for a lot of years with the Packers. As someone, again, who really likes Anderson Silva, who thinks that regardless of what happens moving forward, he's one of the five greatest fighters in the history of MMA. I hope that history remembers him kindly. It's almost like former presidents. You really can't gauge. You look at like Harry Truman. He was hated when he left office, and now people talk about him as being one of the greatest presidents ever. <laughs> you know, It's what? weird how history hey, can perceive public figures. That's true. And it's, you know, you know, no matter what, I don't care if you're the greatest guy in the world, not everyone's going to like you. That's just people. There's people that want to hate. There's people that want to find fault. And there's people that want to bring you down. Because, you know, when you're, when you're the king, when you're sitting on top of that mountain, there's only one direction to go. And that's down and we're all going to go that way. <laughs> Except for us. Yeah, I wish. (laughs) (laughs) Well, every week on this podcast, John and I answer your questions. We're we're still keeping that plateau. Ask away via email, info at letsgetitonpodcast.com. And, of course, please include a pronunciation guide for your name. And that is just what Alex Goral did. Thank you very much, Alex. So you go right to the front of the queue. Alex asks, John, was there ever a time you had to use the bathroom while you were officiating about? Hypothetically speaking, <laughs> isn't that great? If this were the case to happen to any official, and presumably he means referee or judge, how would the situation be handled? I guess you could throw in timekeeper as well. Well, you know, look, at you're an adult, so I would think that you would know <laughs> if you have to go. And if you have to go before the fight, then go run to the bathroom and go. You know, it's... Uh, yeah, they're referees and officials all the time go to the bathroom at shows and you know it's your responsibility and if you have to go during the middle of the fight hold on to it all right that's just the answer <laughs> <laughs> i know as a commentator because i drink an insane amount of diet mountain dew in my personal life yes, even you more do. so when i'm on television and I would always say, how long is the commercial break? Three and a half minutes, no problem. I would scope out where the urinals were before we would do TV. You're right. You're you're, what's, what's funny is you say that, that, but that's true. Every announcer I've ever worked with scopes out exactly the route that they're going to take to the bathroom. So they, if they, they have to, they know exactly where they're going to go and they know how long it's going to take them to get there because it is part of what you think about with officials and stuff. You know what? There comes that point where you know you have time in between. You're I'm in the back with you know fighters and talking about rules and stuff. And there's bathrooms, and you can always go. And you know, I use the bathroom all the time. I wish it was something I didn't have to do. I'd be special. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, Tony Rico. John, I'm curious to know how long in advance of a fight you have to show up. What kind of meetings lead up to the fight? Do you meet with the fighters or promotion before the show and with the local commissions? Also, is there any rule review with the fighters before the event? Good stuff, Tony. Yeah, well, he's, he's got a, most of it down. Let's see. If you're going to take, let's say, a Bellator or UFC, uh, a bigger show like that, we'll say that I know that the first fight of the night is going to be uh, 5 o'clock, we'll say. So if the first fight of the night is 5 o'clock, my call time by the commission is usually going to be about an hour before that, but I will be there two and a half hours before the show. So if it's a 5 o'clock call time, I'm going to be there by 2.30. And I'm, I get there so I can just go in, take my time, look at the cage, you know, do the little things that I'm going to do. I check the cage out. 
I check to see, you know, where my timekeeper is going to be, where my doctors are going to be, all those little things. I'll meet with my commission. I'd never meet with the promotion. No referee is going to meet with the promotion. And I'll meet with the commission. They'll give me my assignments. I'll get, you know, what fights I'm doing. I'll look at my list. I'll then go and find, you know, where the locker rooms are at. And I will go and start face to face with every fighter that I am going to work with. There will be a face to face where I talk to them about about conduct, the rules, all the things. And, and you know, it, it all differs. I just, you know, when I did the, the show in Nashville, um, Jeff Mullen is the executive director of uh, Tennessee, and he had several of his officials, you know, on that show. And his big thing was, he says, I want them to go with you, and I want you to watch them when they talk to fighters, and I want them to watch you. I said, no problem, you know, and, and that's part of, you know, what we do so we can help burn other officials up and get them used to you know what they're doing to you know to actually critique you know sometimes criticize sometimes applaud some of the things they're saying to the fighters and get them to understand what's important and so we'll get, we're going to go over things now if i've worked with a fighter a lot i'm not going to sit there in the back and take a long time i'm not going to go over the list of you know 29 fouls in the unified <laughs> rules that's ridiculous to do okay but you know you're going to see a lot of referees go back and you know some of them will have uh you know, in the smaller shows, they'll do group meetings and they'll pull out a piece of paper with these 29 fouls. And I want to take that piece of paper and stuff it into their left nostril <laughs> because that just tells everybody you, you don't even know the rules because you need a piece of paper to look at them. But you're going to go over about conduct. You're going to talk about this is what I'm going to say to you in this circumstances. This is what I expect of you. This is what you know when I'm saying this. This is what it means and this is what you need to do. So there's never a doubt with the fighter the fighter knows what when you're saying something what it means it doesn't matter what the crowd thinks it means it matters what the fighter knows it means because you've gone over that so you're going to do that with all of them and then by the time you get done talking you know all the fighters you know especially like in a ufc or bellator they come in at different times you're going to get your you know preliminary fighters coming in your main card fighters and then your main event fighters all come in at different times so you're having to run back there and, and do these things over and over and over again but that's just part of the process that we go through, and that's our job. John, when I first started refereeing boxing when I was 24 years old, I was told there are so many things that can go wrong that people are worrying about. Don't be one of them. Whatever time they tell you to be there, be early. Don't be one of those guys, and we've both seen it on big shows, medium shows, and small shows. Here comes the referee or the judge 20 minutes before the first fight, just sauntering in. It looks awful. It sends a bad message. It's just unprofessional. You know, you're supposed to be a professional and you're supposed to do things right. So then do things right. It, you know, if if your time is so valuable that you need to be there just 20 minutes before, then you probably shouldn't be refereeing. And you've seen that too, haven't you? I have. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's not pleasant. And they never seem stressed either. They just walk in. It's like the people who come in late at the movie. They never look stressed at all. I don't get that. And this from Susan Walker, one of our most loyal listeners. During weigh-ins, if male fighters miss weight, they can take their underwear off and be covered by a towel. But the women fighters most likely have never yet stripped down to make weight. So do they have the same amount of time allotted to lose the weight as the male fighters? Well, we love Susan. She's a great listener, John. But we've both seen female fighters strip <laughs> down. We actually haven't seen them all the way strip. But usually it's a shower curtain that comes out. Something a little more covering than for the male fighters. But it does happen. Gina Carano was the first time I recall that in Strike Force. Absolutely. You know, it wasn't in Strike Force. It was in Elite XC. That's right. And, and it was her dad was the one holding the towel. <laughs> you know, it was... Uh, but, you know, Gina always had a little bit of a tough time making weight at that 145 limit. And she uh, had a problem in that fight as far as making weight. And her dad was the one holding the towel. But you can watch, you know, Evic uh, Invicta does a great job. They have actually like this round shower curtain thing that they'll, you know, put over the entire. You don't get to see the fighter at all. It doesn't, you know, you don't have to see him. All you got to see is the scale. And, you know, the fighter's still standing on it. And they'll put the thing over him and get the weight and so girl fighters strip down just like male fighters it's just that we as a society think that oh my god that's a, there's a big difference it's not let's talk about you susan's know, I'd question i'd rather see the female than the male <laughs> john let's talk about the part of susan's question though about whether male or female how much time allotted to lose weight she was saying on male fighters, but it's both. Most commissions, it usually goes to two hours, but then certain commissions, I know it's in the unified rules of the ABC, there's a maximum that you can lose in those two hours. 
You know, there is. And that's where people don't, sometimes they say, well, why weren't they given time to lose weight? It's because they were so far over the weight, meaning over two pounds, that the commission's not going to allow them to lose that much weight. Meaning that if someone's supposed to weigh in, we'll say at 145 pounds, that's the weight class that they're in. They get a one pound allowance of 146. So we'll say that they weigh in and when they weigh in, they're 148.2 pounds. For them to make that weight class, they have to lose more than two pounds. The commission is not going to allow them to re-weigh in. They're going to say, you're over. You cannot re-weigh in because you're too far over. We're not going to allow you to lose that weight because you can't lose more than the two pounds for us. And you're already 2.2 pounds over the, the one pound uh, leeway we give you. And so that's where you'll get people saying, well, but they didn't get to do that. They do get to weigh in if they are within that two pound limit. The, their weight is 145 and they come in, they have that one pound variance and they come in at, we'll say 147, they're gonna be given a time to lose that one pound of weight to get down to the 146. Now that does change when you have championship fights. If you're a 145 pound champion, you must weigh in at 145. They do not give you the one pound leeway. So if you're 145.2, you have to lose that 0.2 pounds. Great stuff, John. Well, still to come on this week's episode of Let's Get It On, we'll speak to Casey Oxendine, the CEO of Arena Combat, which features two-on-two fighting, which of course can quickly become two-on-one fighting. With Big John McCarthy, I'm Sean Wheelock, and you are listening to Let's Get It On. It's the book that Wrestling Observer calls a must-read for any MMA fan. Jonathan Snowden of Bleacher Report describes as riveting and amazing, and thefightner.com says nothing is held back. Pick this book up right away. Is This Legal? The Inside Story of the First UFC from the Man Who Created It, written by UFC founder Art Davey and me, Sean Wheelock, with the foreword by John McCarthy, is now available to listeners of this podcast at the special price of $12.48. That's far less than you'll pay for the book on Amazon and half price of what you'll pay in store at Barnes & Noble. Buy it directly from the publisher now online at ascendbooks.com and enter the promo code LEGAL50. That's A-S-C-E-N-D books.com, promo code LEGAL50. Learn the true story of how the UFC came into existence in the book that Randy Couture describes as honest, shocking, and enthralling, and that has a rating of 4.9 out of 5 stars from Amazon Reader Reviews. Is This Legal? The Inside Story of the First UFC from the Man Who Created It by UFC founder Art Davey and me, Sean Wheelock, with the forward by Big John McCarthy. Available now online at ascendbooks.com for just $12.48 when you use the promo code LEGAL50. Hey, this is Sean Wheelock. And this is Big John McCarthy. If you're a fan of our show, then you're going to love the rest of the Ignotainment podcast lineup. Like the Ocho Man behind the eight ball and the Whiskey Philosopher with Jeff Cooper. You can find these great podcasts and more at Ignotainment.com. Thanks again and enjoy the rest of the program. Let's get it on! When looking for new and exciting clothing concepts, look no further than Lambs to Lions. Lambs to Lions has great designs that incorporates the past from boxing with the new and exciting evolution of MMA. We all start out as lambs, but with time, training, and hard work, we can all become lions. Be part of the Lambs to Lions movement and check out all of their great designs. You can get your Lambs to Lions gear at the Las Vegas Fight Shop or go to lambstolionsbrand.com. Now, back to Let's Get It On with your hosts, Big John McCarthy and Sean Wheelock. We're now joined on Let's Get It On by Casey Oxendine, a former pro MMA fighter, a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and now the CEO of Arena Combat, which features two-on-two -two fighting, which I guess would be best described as MMA meets American Gladiators. Casey, thanks for being on the program. Is that a fair description of Arena Combat? 
Well, you know, it, it, it's it, it's the best way to describe it for those that have never watched it before. You know, it's a good way. Um, I think that really it's it's much more, uh, if you think of it as, as being a, a game, a team sport, uh, with the elements of uh, full contact fighting involved. So, you know, it, it's just uh, sort of expanding on what the mixed martial arts uh, unified rules have and then adding, uh, adding some flair and, and adding some uh, additional action. All right, Casey, I got to ask you. You know, what is your end game with this? What is it that you expect this to accomplish? What are you trying to, what are you trying to get at with this uh, arena combat? So, you know, I, I've been involved in the sport since 1996, uh, and it started with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I'm a black belt under uh, Helio Seneca. I trained with Marco Huas back in the late 90s for a, a I'm long sorry time. about that. Yeah, oh, I took a beating. I promise you. I, I, <laughs> there you go. Match, That's why I said I'm sorry about session that. session that I had, I got worn out. But, um, but you know, the, the idea was that, you know, I was around uh, when, when you were doing big things and, and making changes and, and being involved in something that was new and taking a lot of heat. And and, you know, honestly, you know, I, I, I saw, you know, this is kind of an example, uh, you know, the, the I don't know if you've seen the video, the Gracie video where it says uh, uh, two cops and, a, and an MMA fighter. And it's the training where the, the guys are, you know, the police officers are trying to subdue the one MMA fighter and how they would go about doing it and so forth. So, that you know, it, it's similar to that. You know, we, we did a lot of that training in our gym and, um, you know, and it just so happens that it, it Quits a lot to what's going on in in, uh, in arena combat. You know, uh, a lot of fighters. You know, uh, you know they they've been involved in MMA for a lot of years, and they want uh, a way of expanding, a way of working with their teammates that they train with on a daily basis, and uh, you know, a way to sort of bring them together and even unify their gym more. And arena combat is that way, and that's what I'm looking to do. And in really, you know, mixed martial arts, even though it is not street fighting or it is not reality fighting in its current form necessarily. Uh, it, it does mirror a lot of the self-defense techniques in, in the evolution of martial arts. And I think that arena combat does this as well. It, it, sh it shows a new depiction of how um, combat sports can uh, create a, a self-defense and a martial arts uh, growth for everybody involved. So, you know, we, we do a lot of that type of training. Sometimes we do two-on-one uh, grappling where, you know, two guys are looking to submit one of one of the opponents. Uh, and, 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 you know, it, it, we've seen, we've found that it increases their submission defense. It, uh, it, it creates their overall, you know, it increases their overall uh, awareness. So, you know, if, if you were to you know, uh, walk, be walking down the street and attack, sometimes, you know, just surviving for, you know, a minute might save your life. So for, for me, for me personally, I see that it evolves, it, you know, it shows an evolution in the, in the martial arts schools and, and, a, and a total, totally new awareness. Uh, as a sport, uh, I think that the fans uh, are looking for something a little bit more. They're wanting to see what mixed martial arts has done for the last, you know, 20 years and see something maybe expanded on that. It's kind of like when, when you we took boxing and, and wrestling and jiu-jitsu and all that stuff, we put it together to see, you know, how a reality fight would happen, you know. Now we're seeing another evolution, and it's you know UFC is wonderful. They they are mixed martial arts. They are filet mignon. But you know steak for dinner every night gets old. Sometimes you got to order pizza. You know what I'm saying? You want something different. You want something new. And uh, you know uh, as long as it's you know uh, profitable to the commissions and it's also safe and these uh, safety uh, standards are implemented, uh, you know I want to provide that. All right. Here's my question: When you get into some of the stuff you're saying, though. Okay. You're talking about two-on-one training, and I did two-on-one training, and, and it's exactly the same as what you're talking about. I did it with grappling. Same as what you saw with the Gracie in action, or when the tape you're talking about is the LA County Sheriff's, and it was Hoyler Gracie. And it's two guys that don't know how to grapple trying to hold on to a guy that does. Sure. And what we have when you're going to put two professional MMA fighters into an arena with two more, and then one of those is gone, and now it's two-on-one, this is not two guys that don't know how to grapple. This is two guys that do know how to grapple against one. And the outcome is usually pretty basic. Pretty, it, it doesn't get to the where you have, unless you've got a guy that is at a level way above the two other guys, he, don't, he doesn't stand a chance. So what's the point of it? 
You weren't able to watch our, our last event, the one we held that was unsanctioned here, and we invited all the commissions. This was last year. Uh, we had three situations in the two with it, that it turned out to be a two-on-one situation. In two of the three, the fighter that was in the, the lone fighter survived and went on to win the battle. And again, so, it, so it's not. What was his dry. level compared to their level? Same, equal, equal. We actually brought uh, two uh, Russian and competitors, that, and we got two guys that don't know what the hell they're doing. Absolutely not. <laughs> we, we, if we you're got, working we, as a team. Uh -huh. And you understand how to grapple as a team, it's pretty simple to control one person and make that person have a problem within the one minute time that you're supposedly giving them. So so they so the, the rules of the two on one is not two guys face off to, to fight. It is a survival round. They have the entire arena to escape, to run, to hide, to do anything they can to avoid to avoid being taken down. And oh, so they can run the whole time. So it's not that they have to engage. Absolutely not. Absolutely they not. Can, they, they can jump off, jump off these these big obstacles. We'll they say can move, they, move what's, about. What's the, the tallest the obstacle, arena. Casey? The tallest obstacle is around five feet. Oh no 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 no! I, I was watching the one thing. The one thing is taller than five feet. Well, the the in America, the way the rules have been implemented. Oh, okay, so it's going to be different standards. than what we saw on Absolutely. the tape. Over the last year, uh, year and a half, I have been involved in a process to with with um, with the commissions, the, the commissions I've been working with, with the officials of those states, uh, to look at all the details of of the obstacles, of the of the standards of the two on one, all of these things to make it more safe and to make it practical and make it um, commissionable. Um, and so, you know, this is something I was involved in the legalization process in Tennessee very strongly. And I actually uh, in, in mixed martial arts and I actually promoted the very first mixed martial arts event ever sanctioned in the state of Tennessee. So I was very um, in tuned with how, you know, to to present this to commissions, uh, what we needed to change, how we need to evolve and, and then have a sport that is going to be able to to progress and you know and we're still in that evolution process but a, as of right now we have uh, a basic product that is going to be as safe as as it can be just like mixed martial arts you know obviously mixed martial arts is not 100 percent safe and neither is any other full contact sport no you know because people pass away every every year in in even baseball so um you know th so we've worked hard to to continue this evolution process and there's a lot you know that, that goes into it now i'll say this in the two-on-one situation um you know it, 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 like you say you know it, it's a uh, it, it obviously has its its danger. The biggest thing is sudden impact, meaning if somebody gets hit with something that the referee can't step into and uh, and and do something about before it actually happens. If if a, if a fighter, even in a two on one situation, is taking uh, too much uh, too much. Uh, uh, pressure and taking too many shots, the referee is going to step in. We have three referees implemented. We also have three doctors on site. Okay, so th that referee can step in and take care of of the situation as quickly as possible if if the the fighter is taking too much. And I'll say this: uh, if one fighter is eliminated, just like in MMA, that that other fighter is more than welcome to bow out at that point and and be done and not go into the two on one sudden death. There's nothing that forces this fighter to do this. There's also nothing that forces the fighter to step up into any of the obstacles okay and and utilize them also when it comes to those obstacles you know uh, i know you've seen the viral videos where the guy gets double legged off of the high obstacle and all uh -huh. that stuff well that's that's 100% illegal it's it's practically criminal doesn't matter if it's illegal illegal things happen all the time that's just part of sports i don't give a damn if it's in football hockey mma boxing or your arena combat illegal things are going to happen and if you think that oh because we make it illegal that's going to keep it from happening. That's just being naive. I think that there is a difference between a, 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 a an intentional, overly, uh, you know, accentuated foul, such as, you know, if, if you pull a guy off of a fighter and he soccer kicks a guy in the face. OK, that isn't over. That's not just what well, illegal things happen. You know what I mean? Like there, there are situations where, you know, OK, somebody could could you know fall or or something could happen as as an accidental recourse but but as far as someone actually intentionally taking a guy and suplexing them off of of, of an arena of the arena uh there there are you know before this event i don't know if you read the the lead up uh that was that was uh 
uh, written on MixedMartialArts.com as far as the approval in South Carolina and how it's going to take place. There are going to be multiple um, uh, uh, clinics by, the, by our referees uh, and by the state commission with the fighters prior to this first event. You know, Casey, all, all, all that's great, and I like that, but you're, you're using a commission here in South Carolina that is a brand new commission in itself. They don't truly have a great grasp of MMA, and they've already had a death in MMA in South Carolina based upon not doing things properly. And so now you're going to bring this and say, we're going to do clinics, and we're going to put all this together, and I'm not saying that your intent is not absolutely 100% above board wanting to do things right. But when you sit there and you say something, you know, like the whole thing with the double leg, a double leg is different than a soccer kick. Okay, it's a normal, normal activity that all these guys are doing every day when they're training. It's a normal activity in their fight. And because all of a sudden they're on top of some barrier or on top of some obstacle, and they have an opportunity, all of a sudden, boom, it comes, and they're going to do something that they're naturally trained to do because that's what they do. And then all of a sudden, now they're going off of a five-foot, as you're saying, that's your, your one now, a five-foot obstacle onto the ground on top of someone. And the, that is what starts to take and make it to where I'm not saying that, you know what, th things are, th you're trying to hurt people, but that's where people are going to get hurt. That's where it's going to end up being that, they're going to come back with what you're doing and put it on MMA because it's MMA fighters and MMA is the actual rule structure you're saying that you're trying to follow the unified rules. So the people that you're going after doing this, why didn't you go to Nevada? Why didn't you go to California? Why didn't you I've, go I've to New Jersey? To, I've gone to all of these. I, I, and what did I, they I tell went you? to the ABC commission to speak in I, front no, of no, all no, of no. these. I things. asked you why, did you, why did you not go there? You said you did, so then I want to know what's the answer that they gave you. Okay, when I spoke with Nevada the first time, Nevada was going through a process of removing their current director and implementing another director. Okay, okay. so I have made multiple calls to them to get meetings to go out there and meet with the, the Nevada State Athletic Commission. I have made multiple uh, calls to Andy Foster over the last year and a half, who is a who is a friend, mind you. I, I've known I know Andy he's for a many years. years. Okay, yep. so but but I still could not get the meeting that I asked, even even just to get opinions on what's going on, to get to get help and to get um, uh, assistance in continuing to improve the the format of our event. So I've made contact with you know, and when we did our first event here, we contacted all of the state commissions in the surrounding area and beyond. So I've been on phone calls with a majority of the major athletic commissions uh, here or have at least attempted to make uh, a contact with them. We're talking um, Ohio, which is one of the most respected. I've called New York, and obviously everybody knows the situation in New York. <laughs> That's okay. not what they're calling. <laughs> and, and, you know, I mean, I did. I mean, it's New York's New York. Um, but but I have made these calls, and I, you know, I'm, I mean, I, I mean, I don't have to say I've, I've got phone records to prove it, but I do. And uh, that's a process over the last year and a half, which has been under the radar because, you know, it's difficult to get a lot of these um, uh, different uh, websites and all this to publicize anything that I'm doing, that I'm trying to do. So when I make these calls, it, it feels like I'm being brushed away by a lot of the commissions. And so the ABC meeting was my opportunity to speak with all of the commissions and field all of their questions because what you're saying, you know, you're saying, well, you know, anything, all of these things can happen and, and all of these bad things can happen when, when you're put in the situation. But I still have to say that to evolve into a sport, you have to, you, I, mean, I mean, there are always going to be risks involved. There are risks like in, in football, so many things can happen in football, even if you're I mean, absolutely and, and right. These fighters, and I these want you to understand when I sit there and I'm, a, I'm asking you this, I'm not saying that, you know what, there's absolutely risk. But when you sit there and you say sport, mm -hmm. that's where I'm starting to actually think this is more entertainment. You're trying to entertain people with this type of no different than American Gladiator was entertainment. Where does this go? What is what is UFC? Is it not entertainment? Is it not? Is it not the, Absolutely, the it's entertainment, to, to but make money, it's a to, sport with a structure. It right. has and, and it's exactly a structure what we're doing. It. Okay, so it's how exactly are you doing it? Doing. That's, what I, that's what I was asking. Yeah. 
Well, that's how exactly doing? how we're doing it. We we are refining the rules. We are building a rule set that that uh, incorporates. So you don't even have the, the rule set complete now. Yes, I, we do it's, have the rule it's set. Still complete. It. Okay, we have, so, I, I right. can send that to you. I can email you. Absolutely. And I can actually go into, you know, everything in detail as far as, you know, what our safety precautions are, what additional things that we are doing. And, and like I said, just like with mixed martial arts, you know, there were certain rules put in place and then there were certain things that have been amended. Things will be amended. Um, but right now we are providing everything possible to make our sport, which is a new sport, as safe as possible. When the commission so let me came, ask, when, yes. when you're talking about amendments, who's making the amendments? The commissions in, in, in upon no the, oh. the, the, the commissions have to approve <laughs> and I will say this and and it, it, we, everyone is working together the referees that we have involved okay are, are all respected they are all former UFC referees have have, have uh, being uh, a have former UFC with. referee doesn't mean anything it's the, the UFC wants you back if you've been there you know one time that's congratulations do they want you back so that has nothing to do with this I believe what our referee Blake with this, Ross is highly is is highly respected. Our head referee. Whatever you think, rest. that's great. But what this has to do with is when you're talking about, as I look at it, you, you're a smart guy and your partner, smart guy, but you're doing this a lot like the old UFC did where you're the, you're the person in charge of this organization and your partner is in charge of the international alliance of who does the rules and stuff. This is not the way that you're going to end up having. you got to have regulation through those commissions. And if you've only got one commission, you don't have regulation. No, we have two commissions. We have, we have Mississippi also, and we are pe- but we are pending right now. We have approval by the commissions in well, You're Oklahoma. definitely following the UFC because the first, first regulation they ever got was in Mississippi. <laughs> I know that. I know that. I know that. I, absolutely. But I will say this, and, th- and this is a, a, you know, the, the ordeal. In Kentucky and Oklahoma, we have approval by both of those commissions. Okay, we we currently have that approval. However, but under their stir, uh, sir, um, current statutes with with mixed martial arts and how it has to be how it's written, you like in in South Carolina, if if you read how this happened, you know it is held under the current status of, of mixed martial arts because it can be interpreted uh, interpreted that way. Do you, you see what I'm saying? So in other words, it says, okay, two, two competitors that will kick, punch, and strike in, a, in an environment. And so it is very vague, and, it's, and, and that allows for interpretation of law and allows for our immediate approval under the standards of MMA. With uh, Kentucky and Oklahoma, it's been a year, uh, more than a year-long process because the commissions approved it. They rewrote into the laws, and then they submitted to legislation, which takes an extended period of time to actually rewrite an entirely new sport into their law okay so 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 you're you're saying that this is not mma because it's being portrayed as two on two mma you're saying that we're something else we're a new combat sport that really isn't mma i think it's mma and its fundamentals in that it it offers the the unified rules of okay you can't you know the the basic unified rules of how you attack and strike is based on mma but our point system we have a point system we don't have it is not a judge we don't have a 10 point must okay it's a point system you you get a point for uh, a takedown you uh, you know in in standard competition you get um, uh, a point for a clean or major strike uh, you get a point for an unca- uncontested flurry of strikes on the ground Okay, three points for a knockdown. Okay, and after each one of these situations, the competitors are assessed by by the referee. Okay, if they're hurt, if they're done, they're out. Okay, so and then on top of that, if one fighter is eliminated, you have a five points. Uh, uh, you you score five points for the obstacles. You're looking at anywhere from four to seven points when you hold the obstacles king of the mountain style with your partner. So in essence, you actually lessen the amount of actual combat interaction because you're strategizing. In other words, you're fighting while you're trying to accomplish other goals in in completing the sport. And that's what makes it more of a sport even than mixed martial arts. Mixed martial arts a fight. Casey, you did an AMI event in Virginia for Arena Combat last year. That was unsanctioned because Virginia doesn't sanction AMI MMA, and it fell under that. So coming up September 26th, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, it's your first professional sanctioned event. What did you learn from that AMI event in Virginia that you're going to try to change, do different now with this pro event in South Carolina? Um, I think that 
you know, ju- just as a whole, you know, like I'm happy to have the commissions involved and be able to have their, their you know, them assist us in, in our structuring. OK, because because we were unable to have commissioning, you know, it, just like John said, it is difficult for us to um, uh, to, to not, you know, like there always needs to be an outside perspective you know, just like he said. Okay. And for us, you know, uh, obviously we're looking at, you know, some of the things, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't believe, you know, we've removed the, uh, the heavyweights, uh, and the super heavyweights from competition. We did have one Why? bout, uh, Why? The, the commission, Come on, say the real reason the commission believes that the, the heavyweights one, that it, it is difficult for them to move about the, the obstacles and two, they're larger guys to be on top and moving up and down. They, they don't like the idea they, they, it, it is not a good interpretation of the sport. Wow. That's, that's amazing. We finally that's, found that, a sport, but that's how they feel. Like we're finding a sport or an entertain, or entertainment, you know, enterprise here that is saying it's not good to be big. I like this. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, it, you know, it's, uh, you know, I, I learned a lot in that, you know, just like you were saying that, that there is no way that, that two fighters, that one fighter can survive the onslaught of two fighters. I mean, one, we've, uh, you know, uh, just on a side note, we have removed, you know, certain uh, uh, techniques like heel hook. We won't allow heel hook, uh, you know, in, in uh, especially in the two on one, but at I all, because that. it's, it's one of those, you know, situations too, too hard. It comes on so quickly. Um, but, you know, uh, these were two guys from Russia that was were involved in the original uh, uh, hip show pr- uh, fight uh, event, and uh, the Russian competitors were very very well versed in kickboxing and in in grappling in every avenue, and uh, in the two situations where the fighter survived, they. Uh, uh, the, these these competitors were very strong amateurs uh, and very highly touted. So this is these were not guys off of the street. None of our guys, you know, all of our guys had records um, on mixedmartialarts.com. I, I'm so, not saying that they, I'm not saying that they were am, you know that they were not good guys. But Casey, you're smart enough to know if you take a true black belt level guy and you could take three of them, put one of them against them, the one's going to have his ass hand it to them because the two really know what to do. And as we get lower in belt status, we get lower in levels of what they actually know, things can go on longer. But when you get truly good people doing that, it's, it's not competition anymore. Now it becomes more of a train wreck. It's something that's, people sometimes that's speculation want to see. 100%. Because it's, these guys were at least purple belt level like, in jiu-jitsu. I can speculate all I want, okay? <laughs> it's something that people may want to see because they like seeing the train wreck, all right? But it's not sport. I, I disagree strongly. I disagree strongly that that's not sport. Is absolutely And we will agree 100%. to disagree. <laughs> and I respect you. know, I mean, I, I, I watch oh, same you here, my brother. whole life, and, and I, I respect you uh, wholeheartedly. And I, and I respect you for looking out for, for the safety of, of competitors. But I will say this, and I love mixed martial arts. I've been involved in it for a majority of my life. Um, but And you were there firsthand. Um, it, it is very difficult for uh, when you know when we involve and, and you know we involve headgear and, and and you know the headgear is is basically for uh, for uh, you know to prevent cranial damage. In other words, we don't want broken bones in the, the head. You know, there's this, been this argument that headgear doesn't protect from cumulative you know cumulative blows and and all that stuff. But what it does do is it protects the face and it protects you know the the fighter from getting cuts. A, well, it protects you know a break in in the in the orbital. That's that's proven. It protects so, cuts. Okay. So, uh, but I'll say this, you know, I watched Robbie Lawler and Rory McDonald a few weeks ago. Uh, I I saw Robbie Lawler punch Rory McDonald's nose into hamburger meat over the course of 20 minutes. And to say that that's not dangerous, but our sport is, I I just, you know, I I know the sport I've been involved in. Who who, who said MMA is not dangerous? (laughs) I'm, I'm just, you know, so so in that same you know equation, why if our sport is dangerous, do we not deserve to be commissioned or at least looked at and uh, assisted in in our goals? 
Casey, full respect for coming on. You knew you were walking into it, and just like you did la- last month <laughs> at the ABC, it. I love it. I can't up. believe I'm sitting here carrying on with Big John McCarthy, <laughs> man. It's a, it's amazing. So thank you, thank you very much. John, take the final question to Casey. No, nah, you know, again, you know, I'm not here to beat you down, Casey, and I I admire anybody that tries something and keeps working and walking forward with it and doing their best. And so I admire you for going after what you are. The one thing that I look at is, you know, you always need to remember what it was like to be the fighter. You need to remember what it's like to be the guy out there. And you need to be that person as, you know, the promoter of this. You're exactly right. You always got to be thinking about their safety and what's going to be best for them. One question for you, though, you know, you you uh, you gave me some tough questions. You were asking me, you know, and, and you, you threw a lot of them out there. What let me ask you, what is your you know, if I were to ask you, what do I need to do? What 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 is your suggestion? So if you know, or is your suggestion, hey, do away with this sport. It's it's not it's, it's not worth doing. It's it's you know, because, you know, what what would your suggestions be to take a sport that is young and and make it possible to be commissioned and and uh, accepted worldwide or nationwide here by all the commissions because I feel like I'm doing everything that that you're supposed to do. I am going through the commissions. I'm not sneaking around in these uncommissioned areas and putting on these shows. I'm standing right in front of everyone. I'm saying, hey, I love this sport. There's a ton of fighters that love this sport. They're doing it because they want to do it. Let's make it as great as we possibly can. What what would be your your suggestion? Well, you know, the first thing is exactly what you're doing. You've got to believe and you got to keep walking forward. Even when everyone tells you no, 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 you got to say, okay, and keep walking forward and go after it that way. The, the second thing I would tell you is you're making some errors, in my opinion, as far as MMA came up a certain way and, you know, I was associated with it and there wasn't a whole lot of other referees. When you're sitting there saying uh, you, you brought up Blake Grice's name and you say he's my referee. A promotion doesn't have a referee. State athletic commissions do. Okay. And if you keep on pushing that he's your referee, then it's saying that he's part of your promotion, which says right. that he it, shouldn't it, he it, should not be doing anything with that promotion. He, you understand he what I'm saying? He is sanctioned through South Carolina. I understand he's sanctioned in South Carolina. And, and as well as in Georgia as well. I mean, he is recognized and uh, and and he is put in place essentially at this point. But so so you know, but you're exactly right. If I use the term "he is our my referee," then it it alludes to the fact that he's on my payroll. That's sort absolutely. Of thing. I understand what you're saying. But in this case, Blake Rice is presented by the South Carolina Athletic Commission. They want him involved uh, because they want him involved because he's the one that went to them and said you ought to do this. But but he's also <laughs> but he's well he's inv- <laughs> no no the South Carolina yes, Athletic yes, Commission. Yes yes I know. Team, the South Carolina Athletic Commission came to our first event. We, they were invited, and and Blake Rice came along, and he he was implemented as our referee. So so you know that, that it, it all connects in a way. But I mean, it's 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 not me using Blake Rice to 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 build my sport. I'm Blake Rice is a competent referee that is has continuing growing knowledge of this sport in its current state. And you need you need a lot of Blake Rice's then. This Absolutely. is what I'm telling you. You're exactly You're gonna right. have to get a lot of these guys that truly understand what the concept of this is, truly what they have to be looking for. Because they're gonna have to be looking for a lot. You have them scoring. I know there's someone supposedly supposedly on a monitor watching stuff and everything, but you know, it, it's a different entity. And this is gonna be the same thing as you have a lot of guys that were in boxing that looked at MMA and said, I could do that. And then went in there and absolutely made huge mistakes in doing it. And so no, no you know, basic MMA referee can just walk into that and say, I can do that. You need to educate. And the education of not only the commissions, but the education of your officials is huge. You're absolutely correct. Casey, thanks very much for being a guest on Let's Get It On. I hope we didn't rough you up too much. <laughs> well, I'm roughed up a little bit, but I'm, I had a great time. So thank you so much. And, and again, I appreciate the voice and, uh, and, and the tough questions. That, that's what I've been waiting for for a long time. Well done. That is Casey Oxendine, CEO of Arena Combat. They will be holding their first ever pro-sanctioned event September 26th in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Sean, so you raised a lot of great points. I think the people who know us know that when it comes to MMA and combat sports, we have a baseline of fighter safety. And 
whether this is or isn't MMA, this is definitely a combat sport. Where do you fall on this? And again, you have such a unique perspective because you were there with Art Davey from literally the beginning as he created the UFC. Yeah, well, you know, and then that's part of what I'm you know, trying to, when I'm asking questions to Casey, it's, it, I know it seems like I'm going after him, but I've been there. And I've been where I'm the guy sitting on the outside saying things that, hey, no, you, you need to understand this. And so I'm kind of, you know, playing the other side. But what's going to occur when you sit there and say, well, that's illegal. That doesn't matter because it's what when people get into what they naturally do and they naturally become used to something. That's why, you know, when you had pride and you have fighters that are fighting over in pride and then came to the UFC, they didn't do too well. And there was many elements of why. And the elements, you know, were first off, they had to change what they could do and that was difficult because they had to change their training and then when they got into the fight it just wasn't as natural for them in the beginning and it took time for them to adapt and to sit there and to think that a fighter when he's up on top of a, this big square table thing that's five feet off of the ground is and has the opportunity as the guy you know does something and comes into him and he drops down to think that he's not gonna shoot what is a normal technique is not being it's just not being smart or it's not being honest because it's going to happen. It's not saying that guys are going to sit there and try to purposely pick someone up over their head and throw them off of this obstacle. I don't think that's going to happen because that's not a normal thing that they do. But when you sit there and say that you can't do a takedown off or you can't, have, you can't throw the guy out, it's going to happen. Guys are going to fall off of these obstacles because you have – obstacles you got a big freaking swinging ball and chain in the middle of your <laughs> your combat area okay what's it for you know to try to you know evade okay fine i understand that i i understand he's trying to come up with something new and i'm all for him coming up with something new but the problem is with what he's coming up with new he's trying to use what is old he's trying to use now what is mma as his baseline and we're, we're using the unified rules well then what you're doing is not new you're just trying to add a bunch of bullshit with it to try to say, well, look at now we're even more and come up with your own stuff. That's what he's going to have to do. The UFC, the world of MMA came up with its own stuff. And that's what Casey's going to have to do with arena combat. He's going to have to get away from MMA. It could have some elements of MMA and you can use some of the rules out of the unified rules for your arena combat but when you sit there and you try to just say we're going to use mma boom you're making a mistake it's not going to work for you because that is was set up for a certain sport and you're trying to put it into a different sport you're trying to put a round peg into a square hole don't do that start making a new square peg for that hole all right john so here's the real question for me let's say that you get a call from the south carolina commission they say john you're the best in the business which everybody acknowledges September 26th, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, we need you there. What's your answer? I would say, you know, thank you very much, but no, I can't do that. I don't understand it, and I'm not going to do something I don't understand. Uh, I, would not be, I would not be good for the participants, and that's really what, you know, I'm there for. So why am I going to put myself out, you know, and when I'm a danger to those fighters instead of being someone that is a benefit? You know, and as I look at this, if he does go in the Mississippi and Oklahoma, he's already done the Amy show in Virginia. They do more shows in South Carolina. A question that I have, and I asked Casey this when we talked at the ABC. That's why I didn't ask it here. I can share it now. Who are your referees? He talked about using different fighters. He talked about using Nate Jolly, who fought when I was in Bellator. Are MMA referees, are known A and B level MMA referees going to come into this? Or is it like the 1990s of MMA when you're getting guys who are training at your gym or fans or dads? Who exactly are you getting as the officials? I know we talked about Blake Grice, but I don't think Blake Grice is going to work every show. And what if you go into a state like Oklahoma where they don't want to license Blake Grice? Well, you know, it could be that Blake Grice is the guy that's going to work every show. And that's fine. I don't have a problem with that if it's the Oklahoma State athletic commission calling blake and saying hey we have this event we want you to come referee it great let blake come and referee it and you know this may be blake's thing that he you know is the, he's the guy at and that's awesome but this is no different than what we had in mma when we had a ton of boxing officials say i could do that and got in there and had no idea what they were looking at on the ground and made huge mistakes and affected fighters lives and affected 
their you know livelihood and just because you're an MMA official doesn't mean that you're going to be the person that's right for this type of you know entertainment sport whatever you want to call it if it's arena combat great they need to educate officials they need to get people that truly understand this is what you do because when you start to cross over into all these different ones look at i cross over i do boxing kickboxing mma you know muay thai it's not easy to remember all the different rule sets of how what's different in all of these different things and in different states where you go to different states there's different regulations you know it becomes a lot of overload so I look at, you know, if they're going to do this, they need to come up with people that are going to be arena combat officials. You're not an MMA official. You're an arena combat official. And that's why I say they need to get rid of trying to use the rules of MMA for their show. They need to come up with their own rule set that absolutely is intended just for what they do. John, last point on this. Do you think Casey Oxendine is on to something with arena combat, or do you think this is just one of those speed bumps of combat sports history that comes and goes? Or maybe in 10 years you think, wow, this is another viable combat sport that's taken off. After all, Art Davey, Horian Gracie, caught people out of nowhere in 1993. You know, they did. And then Art Davey tried a thing called X-Arm that you know how well did it do uh, <laughs> okay, he, he so. got he got beaten up on it and it was tough uh, with my uh, really close friendship with art he got hammered on x he got hammered on it and, and you know you look and you go hey it's hard to catch lightning in a bottle it is the one thing that casey in my opinion has going for him is he has american gladiators going for him that was a very successful entity for a long time until it got so silly with some of the stuff it did and you know having you know true athletes in here competing and having something that he has set up as far as a structure for it as a sport saying look at we're going to have teams great you have teams and these teams are going to meet in a season and these this season is going to do this and each team will meet this many times and we'll get our champion great that's awesome that's something that people can actually have something that they're looking down the road towards as far as a finale they want to see it and they can get into liking the people that are doing it and the teams or whatever it is they you know catch on to. That's just my suggestion. If he, he wants this to work, he's got to be smart about how he makes it work. And don't try to make it two-on-two two MMA. You try to make it two-on-two two MMA, you're going to fail. You've got to make this a new entity. Use that American Gladiator system that they have because of all the obstacles they have in this thing. Use that as your platform of making this a different sport john i do want to have one final final point how cool are you that you brutalize our guest and he's really happy and appreciative that he was on <laughs> dude come on now who else in the world can get away with that ah <laughs> uh, dude you know I, I i don't mean to brutalize casey i like casey casey's a good guy and and you know i you just got to be honest and ask ask the you know the true points of well look at you're saying this but what about this and you know, you're going after this and you're going after it, trying to do it now the back doorway, you know, by going to South Carolina. You know, there, I understand what he's saying is, look, I've, I'm trying. I'm trying to do it. And that's all he can do is try. And I, you know, I give him credit for going up in front of the ABC. But, you know, when he went up in front of the ABC, it was the last day, the last hour. And everyone was burned out. And that's why you were the only one asking questions <laughs> and stuff. I was. You know, so that's, you know, it's it's a matter of, it's going to take a lot, but you know, if this is something that he's passionate about and something that you know he believes in, then he has a chance. If he's not, you know, that passionate about it, if it's something he's just trying to make a buck off of, then it's probably not going to make it. And as your wife Elaine will attest, it's all about your charm, John. That's it. You can get away with anything <laughs> with that charm, right? I have no charm. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we are back with you next week for a new episode of Let's Get It On, first available on Friday. Download and subscribe to our podcast on the iTunes Store. For Android, download the Stitcher app and subscribe. And you can go straight to our website, letsgetitonpodcast.com. You can also find us on social media, facebook.com slash letsgetitonpodcast, and on Twitter at Podcast MMA for this show, and for us personally, at John McCarthy MMA and at Sean Wheelock. To ask us a question, make a comment, or inquire about becoming a sponsor of Let's Get It On, email us at info at let's get it on podcast.com. Again, that's info at let's get it on podcast.com. And do please help us spread the word. This is very much your podcast as much as it is ours. For the charming big John McCarthy, Casey Oxendine. 
who stood there and took it well done and our outstanding producer as always chris lakin as well as our entire crew i'm sean wheelock thanks for listening everyone this has been a presentation of ignotainment media network online at ignotainment.com let's get it on with big john mccarthy and sean wheelock only on the ignotainment media network Don't forget to leave a rating and review in the comments section of the iTunes podcast store. If you have questions, comments, or are interested in sponsoring the show, contact us at info at letsgetitonpodcast.com or check out our additional lineup of podcasts, including Ocho Man, Behind the Eight Ball, The Whiskey Philosopher, and Youth Baseball Talk at ignotainment.com.